Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man that would like to advise us all that it's not really work, it's just the power to charm. Here is the captain. Again, I thought you were going to go into, like, Huey Lewis and the news or something. It's the power of love. It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Today we are drinking Maniacal by the awesome brewers over at Port City Brewing Company. Maniacal is a double IPA that's perfectly balanced. We got some awesome hoppiness with tropical and citrus aromatics as well. This is 8.9% ABV, so drink it at home in your garage. And if you do, I think you will agree with us. Our garage grade for Maniacal is four and a half bottle caps out of five. Let's give some cheers to our good friends. First up, a big cheers and we like your jib to Michaela in Winthrop, Massachusetts. And a big shout out to Mary from Galena. Next up, a shout out and cheers to Colleen in Helena, Montana. And a big we like your jib to Dan in Cannonsburg, Pennsylvania. Next up, a huge Ron Swanson please and thank you to new friend of the show, Jennifer D. from Delaware, Ohio. And last but certainly not least, a cheers to Paige from Lansing, Michigan. Everyone we just mentioned went to TrueCrimeGarage.com, and they contributed to this week's beer fund, and for that, we thank you. Yeah, B-W-E-R-U-N, Beer Run. And to all of our true crime addicts, you are all 10,000 candles in the wind, and that is enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. It's been well over a decade since two Collier County men were last seen. In fact, this week will mark 17 years to the day that anyone has seen Terrence Williams. Law enforcement is still actively on the hunt to piece together the mysterious disappearances of both men. 23-year-old Philippe Santos was the first to go missing in October of 2003. After Santos got into an early morning fender bender, Collier County Deputy Steve Calkins was dispatched to the intersection of Amokalia Road and Airport Pulling Road. Instead of leaving him abandoned alongside of the road, Calkins says, this is what he told investigators, that he did the young man a favor. According to Detective O'Neill, who has worked this case, O'Neill says he, meaning Calkins, drives him about a quarter mile east to a convenience store, where Calkins says he issued him three citations and allows him to use a phone, and according to Calkins, it's the last time that he sees Mr. Santos. It's also the last time anyone saw Philippe Santos. Now, fast forward three months to January 2004. That's when Terrence Williams ran into some car problems and encounters Deputy Calkins. It's unclear exactly what transpired because Officer Calkins' recollection of these events have changed several times according to his statements. Again, back to Detective O'Neill. He says, quote, witnesses tell us that there was an exchange, a conversation between Calkins and Williams. Nothing alarming, but Mr. Williams was placed in the back of Calkins' patrol car. And just like Philippe Santos, that was the last time anyone saw 27-year-old Terrence Williams. Collier County Sheriff's Department have been very transparent about this situation, and I applaud them for that. We have Detective Kevin O'Neill on the record saying, quote, the facts, the testimony, and what happened keeps bringing us back to one person, Steve Calkins. Yeah, because in all these cases, we have eyewitnesses that are not uh, connected to the individuals. They have no dog in the fight, like you'd say. Well, and in this case, the Collier County Sheriff's Department, they have a big dog in the fight. One of their own is being looked at for 
potential involvement in the disappearance of two young men. A big cock in the fight. And that's why I think it's important that they've been transparent and they've investigated their own here. They've investigated Stephen Calkins. We have so many situations where we talk about theories and conspiracy theories of police cover-ups and so on and so forth, but that does not seem to be the situation here. We have, again, Detective O'Neill on the record saying most of his, meaning Steve Calkins, accounts are troubling to any investigator who looks at the case because there are inconsistencies in his stories. We have three agencies at one point that were actively working this case. A good, that gives you a good little checks and balances there. All three agencies were pleading with the public to reach back into their minds and let them know anything that could help bring this case to the next level. Detective O'Neill again, quote, if they saw an interaction between a patrol car and a citizen back then in a wooded area, a parking lot, the back of a business, something that is just not normal. We want to hear from you. Anybody that wants to look into this case on their own, I think a good starting place would be the Charlie project. And that's the Charlie project org. You can go to their website and that's Charlie C H A R L E Y project.org. There's a very good page for each individual with some detailed specific information on both of these missing persons cases for both Philippe Santos and Terrence Williams. Well, I think the tough thing here is that you have law enforcement. What are they signing up for? To protect and serve. But we have these two men that go missing, and the last person known to be with the men are law enforcement that are supposed to protect and serve these individuals. So what would be his motive to get rid of these guys or make these guys disappear? That's a very good question. And in regards to the public's assistance in helping law enforcement with this case, we, as well as others are asking that you contact these different agencies, but one of them includes the Collier County Sheriff's office. And people would say, well, why would I want to call them? They're probably, you know, one of their own might be responsible for why these two are missing. Again, I think they're doing good work here. They have recognized and observed this to be a problem that one of their own is a problem. They do not trust his own words. They do not trust what he is saying to them. In fact, they let him go. And this was in rather short order as well. Mm -hmm. We have these individuals go missing between October 2003 and 2004, January 2004. And it's August of 2004 that they fire him from the sheriff's department. Now, this is a guy, Calkins, as much as we, he's got no friends here in this garage, mm. he had a pretty squeaky clean record up to that point. And I think that's why when they looked at him in this Santos missing persons case and cleared him, you're going, okay, that makes sense. He's been on the force at this point for 17 years, completely clean record. He doesn't have a, a history of violence. He doesn't have uh, incident reports one after another. No, this was on paper appears to be a good cop for 17 years. In fact, he has uh, awards for saving lives during that time. Period. Right, right. We don't have people in the community coming out and saying, hey, we think he's donkey balls crazy. Or there's some reports of him getting in bar fights or that he has a short temper or anything, or that he's even rough with people that he's arrested. There's just really no reports of that. Well, and you have an easy route to saying, okay, well, Santos is either flying under the radar because he wants to avoid these right. charges or he went back to Mexico. Right. Then we also have the added situation later. Now, Calkins is never cleared in Williams case. In fact, Terrence Williams case really stirs everything up again as far as the Santos case goes. And now he's being looked at for both. But in Williams case, Steve Calkins is going to tell us all, look, I'm innocent of this. I didn't do anything to either of these guys other than give them a ride. And both of these dudes have reasons to not surface. They both have reasons to run and hide. Santos may be back to Mexico. Who knows? Right. But 
Terrence Williams, remember we mentioned that he was from Tennessee, moved down to Florida to be close to his mother. He is a father and he has working two jobs because he's trying to keep up with child support. He's the father of four. And unfortunately for those four children, Mm. even in 2004, Terrence Williams had fallen well behind on that child support. In fact, he was in the rear so much. I think it was like five, $6,000 at that point. Once he goes missing and this could be another quinky dink, Mm -hmm. but two days later, there's a warrant out for his arrest because he's got all this back child support that needs to be paid. So he has he has reasons for ducking the law as well. And we don't know if he knew that was coming. Right. He would know that he's behind. He may not know that they're getting ready to file anything on him. Now, that's a long way of saying that I believe that the Collier County Sheriff's Department has done their due diligence in looking at one of their own. They let him go. He was fired from the department. They did some other sneaky things that I really like here, Captain. You know how sneaky we like to be, right? Mm. They put a GPS tracking device on his patrol car. Oh, that's a good start. Unbeknownst to Officer Calkins, yeah. hold, Hold on. There should be GPS on all their cars because... Let's say there was, right? You're signing up to serve and protect. You take these individuals to, quote unquote, a Circle K. The GPS proves it. So why wouldn't you want one on your car? Just the same reason why we should have body cameras on every police officer. It backs up whatever story that you have. Correct. But you're also stating that 17 years right, right, right. after the fact. Technology wasn't what it is today back then. So- But they they had GPS back then. But they didn't on their vehicles. And so they put this, just like if if they were surveilling you for Mm -hmm. involvement in something or if they thought you were involved in something, they they will sneak and put, all right, we got a search warrant for your truck. Well, we'll, let's put this little device on his truck and be able to monitor where he's going. Why do they want to do that with Calkins? One- Probably mm-hmm. just for the fact that you're worried he might do something else. Well, I was just going to say that, you know, I was a suspect in the floppy dong murders. But two, you want to know if mm. he did do something terrible, if he did off one or both of these missing individuals yeah. and place them somewhere. Well, can we get on record him going off to some remote location? We know how these guys like to return to the scene or check on what they left or what they hid. That never happened. They put the device on his patrol car. Um, I'm wonder, I I don't know for certain if they were able to do this with his civilian vehicle as well, but they never had him going off into some strange location or some wooded area or remote area where they would be able to find the remains of either one of these individuals yeah looking at this case early on i i wondered if this officer had any kind of like fishing hobbies or hunting hobbies that maybe he would have locations that he could dispose of bodies so i saw a news report and it was very it was a little troublesome but i i don't know i don't have enough information for it to totally weird me out But in 2012, law enforcement was searching this wooded area near that Wiggins Pass Road, which would not be terribly far from where he says that he dropped off Terrence Williams at the the Circle K. Uh And the lead in for the story that they're telling on the news is that law enforcement searching this area because it was a known, their words, a known hangout of Officer Calkins. Seemed like a bizarre now i don't know what's going on in that area right like you said maybe maybe this is a fishing hole or maybe there's reason for him to have hung out in that area they didn't go into any but it looked like an area that nobody goes to right which is bizarre now yeah but sometimes with these patrol officers they have these little spots that they go to to you know do paperwork or or whatever it is when i worked at a studio, we were kind of in the middle of nowhere and we had a very long drive uh, driveway 
and constantly sheriff patrol officers were back in that drive filling out paperwork or maybe taking their lunch break or whatever. Yes, I know that spot. That's a nice peaceful spot. And I know of uh, bars that I've worked at in the past where we would tell officers, if you need somewhere to park to, to do your paperwork or what have you, feel free to park behind the bar any hour. You know, the law enforcement presence here is not uh, a bad thing. Yeah, the only bad thing is when a week later the son of a bitch catches you for speeding and you're like, hey, buddy. We give you a place to park all the time. You can't let me go. Thought we were friends, bro. I thought, I thought we were. <laughs> thought we were friends. I thought we were cool. We used to give free coffee to all the officers at the gas station too. That it's nice to have them coming in and out. Yeah. Okay, so Captain, what we have here is let's go down this road of the investigation that the Collier County Sheriff's Office did on one of their own, and we have some audio clips that we will get to, but. One of these clips, actually all these clips are very important, but the the first one that I'd like to talk about is we have dispatch calling Officer Calkins at his home. He's at home on his day off. They're calling him just days after Terrence Williams was last seen. Days after this incident where he encounters Terrence Williams, says he takes him to a Circle K gas station, and then later tows this 1984 white Cadillac. When he's called at home by dispatch, he's he can't remember anything. He can't remember anything at all. Dispatch is calling his house because William's mother has tracked down. Remember, she located the vehicle, right. figured out that Calkin's name was on the tow bill, and now she's on the phone with the Collier County Sheriff's Office wanting to know what their interaction was with her son and where her son may be. Right. And was he charged with anything? So dispatch is going, Hey, Hey Dick clown, what happened? Hello, 
One thing that stands out on that call from dispatch to Steve Calkins at his home immediately is he doesn't really answer any of the questions. This is what I want people to focus on when they're thinking about that call. Every question that he's asked, did you arrest someone? Do you remember a Cadillac? Do you remember this going on just a few days ago? To each question, he says no. He's not saying no I mean, at some point, yes, he does outwardly say, no, I didn't arrest anyone. But in most of those instances, he's not saying no as his answer. He's saying no almost as he doesn't recall. He doesn't remember. And this is very interesting to me because this is either one of two avenues that I think you could go with your suspicions about Calkins. Either A, he's just like a dumb child you know how like a child when you ask them hey you did this this is terrible what why did you hit your sister why did you throw this toy did you did you say this curse word at school yeah why did you scratch your butt and sniff it well a lot of times a child when accused of something that they did Mm. their defense mechanism will click in sometimes that it's just i don't remember right uh uh what No, I don't remember. I don't remember anything. Or you go down the other avenue, and this is very strategic of Mr. Calkins, and he can say, oh, I was put on the spot, so I just claim not to remember anything, and then when when it's brought up again, then I will provide some information. But I'm claiming at this point not to remember anything, so I'm not locking myself into anything specific. Right. And he <laughs> he actually set himself up for this on the dispatch call, probably knowing that it was being recorded. Uh, I'll have to look into my notes. Yes. Yeah, I'll have to look into my notes, and then I'll be able to remember. I think he would remember going up to somebody in the, in the graveyard, right? Yeah, so I have, I have several problems with him not remembering. But where, one, I go either, okay, he's deceptive he's a bad officer and a bad person and he's lying to us or let's let's give him the benefit of the doubt if he doesn't remember he's probably just a bad officer you have to have have some kind of memory when you're in that line of work and other lines of work as well but he can remember that he hasn't arrested somebody in a long time in a long time but i think you're right captain here here's what we have the dispatcher is providing him with pretty detailed information. Hey, at this time, you called in a tow for a 84 white Cadillac. Now, I've seen pictures of this 84 white Cadillac. This is 2004. This is not a vehicle that he's going to encounter every day. Right. This is a unique vehicle, and it's one of those big boat standout Cadillacs, ones that you you would notice this vehicle in a parking lot full of other vehicles. Right. It would stand out. 
And then you are very, very astute, my friend, because you, you said the cemetery. How could you not remember four days earlier, this big giant whale of a white Cadillac in a cemetery? And here, here's how I think, you know, he's lying is because the story then becomes, oh yeah, I took that individual for a seven minute ride to drop him off at work. So you didn't remember the unique car and the unique location with the man that you spent at least seven minutes driving to drop him off at work that you then eventually called and found out he was lying. And we know that you were there because of the paperwork, because you had the car towed. Take it a step further. I would guess that he is not in the business of doing favors for civilians on the daily. Right. He, his own words, says, I did the guy a favor. I took him for a ride. I I dropped him off at this location. Oh, and then later I figured out that he deceived me. I checked the paperwork in the glove box. It was not there like he told me. So how I, I just find it incredibly hard to believe that this officer fails to remember this big, giant, white, unique Cadillac his interaction with this young man in the cemetery and that, Oh, I did the guy a favor, let him off the hook. And then he lied to me. And that's why I had the vehicle towed. And it's just a couple days later. I, it, it seems bizarre to me and incredibly hard to believe that he wouldn't remember this. So, well, I think he's being nefarious. And the reason why is he no and pause. And then when you, when you're not able to pause because the person's not giving you any information back, what does he do? <laughs> I just I don't remember. <laughs> well, at least he's smart enough to inquire what this is about. You know, he's trying to get to the bottom of, well, why is the dispatcher calling me? Oh, there, there's this lady that's been calling us all day because her son is missing. And we right, have people but here, at the cemetery saying that they saw an officer put him in the back of a a patrol car. Another reason why I believe he's lying is you don't remember anything. And now you're going, well, why are they calling? Because you want to know what do they know? All right, we're back, you crazy animals. Cheers to you. Cheers to your family. Cheers to all your loved ones. We're all in this together. Getting crazy with the animals. Is that what you said? (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) All right, we have another clip that I want to play for you here. And this one, the audio is a little more difficult than the last clip. But this clip is extremely important. So I want you to pay close attention to what is going on and then we'll review it afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, <laughs> I barely can understand half of that. So he's definitely calling in a VIN number, and then they're they're making some jokes, but I can't really make out what what they're saying. Okay, so there's, I mean, he's being a, a complete jackass on half of the the call. He's goofing around, and whomever he's calling this into is goofing around with him as well. Later, Steve Calkins will say the guy that he was phoning this into for the VIN check is a friend of his, and they're they're goofing around. Um, you know, look, this happens at work. People act in a manner that's less than professional when they're interacting with somebody they might be, quote-unquote, buddies with at work. I do believe that police officers should be professional and this is uh, the the only the only thing that i can think of when i hear how calkins is acting during this call is that he's probably got a little uh racist bone in him somewhere and he's or multiple bones well or, <laughs> he's he's an asshat is what he is to put mm. it plain and simple it, prick dumpster yeah but so he's calling in the vin number now let's go back to what he has told us is going on in the incident report that he dropped off williams returned to the vehicle only to discover that the information that he was looking for that he was told by williams that he would find inside the vehicle is not there now he believes that he's been deceived and that the vehicle may possibly be stolen. So that is why he's calling in the VIN number. You can hear Dave, his buddy Dave, who's on the other end, is saying, oh, good. Let's Racist see, Dave. Let's see what we come up with. Mm -hmm. You know, we're going to run this number. Let's see what we come up with. Maybe it's been reported stolen somewhere. It doesn't come up with any stolen report. But if we're going to overlap this call with the information he provides us in the incident report, that's where we're at in his timeline. He's dropped off Williams, he's returned to the vehicle, and now he's calling in the VIN to discover if it, it has in fact been stolen or not. And you notice he doesn't tell his buddy, oh, by the way, I just took this guy to work. And now no, I'm he back says no one's vehicle. around. He says right. that the, the vehicle appears to be abandoned, to which Dave responds, oh, good. You know, let's see what we come up with here. Yeah. There's one little thing that's very interesting at the end of that call, and you may not have picked up on it because it is hard to hear. Mm -hmm. He says to Dave, oh, good, the tow company is already here. Mm. That's interesting, that, and that's very important to this story, and you'll see why after we play this next clip. Now you're probably thinking, what the heck are they making me listen to? That is very hard to hear, but we wanted to play the evidence that they put out on their website. Colonel, how about you break down what we should be hearing on that audio clip? Well, I'm going to tell you why this is proof positive that we should all be very suspicious of Officer Calkins. And it's this is going to underline and put... The, uh, underline it 10 times, everything that we've already been telling. We've said questionable behavior. We've discussed questionable behavior. This is evidence of such. This is why I believe they fired him and why I believe that they've publicly stated he's a person of interest in these two missing persons cases. So the order that we played those calls in 
is not as important as the order that they were actually placed in. We played them in the exact order that they were placed in, right? <laughs> okay. Why is that important? So what did we did we cover so far? In the first call, he's calling in the VIN. He wants to figure out if this car is, in fact, stolen. He says at the end of that first call, oh, the tow company is already here. Think about that for a second. He's already called the tow company and put in the order for the tow before he's figured out if the vehicle has been stolen or abandoned. In his incident report, he states that thinking that he it might have been stolen or abandoned, he called it in and then had it towed. No, he had it towed first and then called it in. Right. Okay. The tow company is already here. Then later, after the tow company is there and picks up the vehicle, this by his own words in these recordings, now he's calling in for a background check on an individual. Who is that individual? Terrence D. Williams. That's what his words are on this call. Calling in Terrence. He spells the name Terrence. Mm -hmm. He says D for the middle name. Terrence's middle name is Dion. Williams, traditional spelling is what he says. This is important for several reasons. First, his own reports and what he will tell officers and investigators from that point on is, I only knew his first name. He told me his name was Terrence. I gave him a ride. I did him a favor. Well, we know that's not true because you're calling in Terrence D. Williams. Right. But is, okay. but is there any information in the car that would lead him to that information to to have his full name well that is this is the icing on the cake this is why you have to say to yourself he had to have been in the presence of terrence williams longer than he has told us and how do we know that to be absolutely true when he has to give a birth date for this person that he's calling in the birth date that he gives is 4 1975 April 1st, 1975. Mm -hmm. That is not Terrence Williams' birthday. Terrence Williams' birthday is January 17th, 1976. His family has come forward and said, you know what, when he was in trouble with the law in the past, he would give a fake birth date when asked to identify himself. The fake birth date that he would give would be April 1st, 1975. April Fool's. So... What I'm pointing out here is there is no driver's license or state identification card that will state that Terrence Williams was born on April 1st, 1975. This is not information he could have got from anywhere other than from Terrence Williams' mouth. Right. Now, why is this important, the order of these calls? At the end of the first call, he says the tow company is already here. And then later calls back in to get a background check on Terrence D. Williams. But he also stated that there's nobody with the car. There's no one around. And his incident report says that by this point, he's already dropped off Williams at the Circle K, returned to the vehicle. We know this to be true as well because, or portions of this to be true as well, because we have the employees at the cemetery who state, he put Williams in the back of the vehicle, drove off, and then sometime between 15 minutes and one hour later, he returned, moved the Cadillac a bit of a distance, and then they showed up and towed the vehicle away, right? Think about this for a second. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have pointed out that we have a situation where this officer did not have enough time to go off and murder someone and hide the body so well that nobody would ever find it 17 years later. Two idiots are in a garage somewhere in, in Ohio talking about this case. They said that that couldn't be done. What I'm pointing out here is, is there a chance, given this evidence, that he took Terrence somewhere and then returned to Terrence after the vehicle was towed? Right. How did he get this information? He's providing information that could have only have come from Terrence himself. And this is after the fact that he says that he saw Terrence. This is after the fact of him having the vehicle towed away. There's something very fishy about this. And I'm telling you, the sheriff's department know it to be true as well. They took this information and used this information to fire this officer. They said to him, 
what you are telling us makes no sense. We know that you needed to be in the presence of Terrence at the time of this call or shortly before this call. And this is after the time that you said you were done with him for the entirety of the day. They are on record telling this man, you are one of our own. We are not coming after you. We are looking to clear you, but your own statements will not allow us to clear you. Right. But on top of that, if you base off the eyewitnesses testimony, they're saying at some point he put Terrence in the back of his police car. Well, let's say he's in the back of the police car. Then he's calling about this VIN number. He is lying to his fellow officers about any contact with Terrence. Correct. The night that he had contact with Terrence. Correct. It's bizarre. And you have to wonder, okay, let's go off of his information in his incident report. He says that after returning to the vehicle, not finding the information he was told would be in the vehicle, he felt that he was deceived and that the vehicle may have been stolen. Okay, well, we know that he has it towed. He calls in the tow. We hear him at the end of that call saying, oh, the tow company is already here. Right. Is there a chance that he drives back to the Circle K where he did, let's say he did drop Terrence off at the Circle K. He finds Terrence there or... Maybe, as the clerk says, she saw Terrence filling up a gas tank, a gas can, and then walking away. Was he so pissed off that he drove around looking for Terrence Williams after the vehicle was towed away and then picked him up later and did something terrible? Yes, I, I, I don't really understand the, you know, the motive. Is he just this racist, murderous dick? Well, that's the thing. A lot of people look at this case and they jump the gun a bit and they say, all right, well, this is a cop who turned into a serial killer or this is a serial killer cop who, who knows? I mean, he's not offering up any information and the information that he has provided is false. It's not correct. So then you have to go, okay, well, if he's lying about this and we know he is lying about this, that may not be anything illegal within the confines of, of what we know him to be lying about. But then you go, well, if he's lying about this, what else is he lying about? What other things is, is he conveniently leaving out and not remembering? He must be lying about this. He refuses to admit that he saw Terrence at any point after dropping him off at the circle. K. We know he's lying about that. Why? Why is that so important for him that all of us believe that he never saw Terrence after that. And I think it's because he did something illegal. He did something very wrong. Now, what what level of, of uh, crime is that? We don't know. Right. It could be as simple as one of the big theories in this case is a starlight tour. Well, what is a starlight tour? That phrase was named, made famous because of cases up in uh, Canada where officers would pick up people for very minor infractions. These are probably repeat offenders, minor infractions. They're fed up with having to deal with these individuals. They're not going to be punished by the law because they are minor infractions. So what these officers were doing is they would drive the individual out in the middle of nowhere, force them to get out of the vehicle and just leave them there. Right. You got to find your own way home, buddy. Oh, oh, you're, you're drunk again in public or you're, you're in a bar fight again. I've picked you up. This is the second time I've picked you up this week. You're a nuisance. Yeah, but this is a strange thing to do in the middle of the day. It's a very strange thing to do in the middle of the day. And that's the other thing, you know, people jump the gun. I I say jump the gun because people say, well, this guy's very obviously a serial killer. I don't know that we can say that because I do not see premeditated murder in either one of these situations. Why? Because look, the guy's been on the force for 17 years. He's while I find him to be a complete asshat, it means he's not dumb enough to go, Oh, I've had all these witnesses and I'm just going to, I'm just going to murder this guy. And he never surfaces ever again. Why not? If, if this, if that were his MO to kill, just to kill, to kill to, um, on some kind of mission, he would pick, situations where there are no witnesses. I guarantee you that, that and that's that's a, what's a little bit scary here, Captain, is that you have to wonder when when people go missing and there's no and there are these witnesses, what has happened 
with this officer when there's no one around, when there's it's the middle of the night. Um, yeah, but people of power can form a, a sense of uh, arrogance and a sense of um, righteousness where it doesn't matter what you see. I, I am the law. Right. Right. Now, I, I think that if this were a situation where he murdered either of these individuals, that it was reactionary. It wasn't premeditated. It was something along the way happened and he reacted to a situation. I, I, I can see where you're coming from, but I, I don't think that you can rule out the possibility of premeditation as far as like, I have this person now in my custody and now I'm going to figure out what to do with them. Right. I'm just saying, I don't see a situation. It doesn't make any sense to me, a situation where he's waking up that morning going, Oh, if I pull somebody over, I'm, I'm going to kill them and leave them out in the middle of nowhere. Especially when we have all, I mean, we have, we have multiple eyewitnesses at both of these situations so much so that at the cemetery, he spoke Calkin spoke with the cemetery workers. It's not like they happened to see him from afar. He talked to them that night. He, I'm sorry, that day. Right, but we're com- we're in complete agreement that he is com- he's completely full of shit. I mean, I here's absolutely this guy believe that's he did a, something to Terrence Williams. Right, a couple days later, oh, I don't remember this unique car and this unique location where I talked to people that work there at the unique location and I moved the car. Yeah. I absolutely believe he did something to Terrence Williams. And I base that off of the evidence that we've just provided today. The sheriff's department's belief that he was had interaction with Terrence Williams after he says that he did the thing here again, I'm going to, you know, when you compare a serial killer to someone who kills to cover something up, that's two completely different monsters. And I think that there, there could be a situation here where this is reactionary. Maybe Terrence did something that pissed this officer off and he, he struck him or he, he, he brutally attacked him and then decided, Oh, I gotta, I gotta cover this up. I gotta silence this guy forever. I think there, that we're, we have a good amount of evidence here that, that he very well could have drove around and looked for, Williams, if in fact he did drop him off at the Circle K that day. I say that I feel strong, more strongly about Terrence Williams' case than I do Santos's case because there is some indication that Santos could have fled the country altogether. Right. And it's just a coincidence that these two are linked in that manner. I did find statements by close relatives of his that say that he was considering moving back to Mexico before any of this took place. I'm not ruling out the possibility that that Calkins did something to Santos as well. I'm just saying there's a, a there's a little more question of what if in that case. Yeah, I think there's more evidence and more eyewitnesses obviously in the Williams case. But again, kudos to the Collier County Sheriff's Department for Look, they they didn't turn and look the other way. They went head on into this thing when presented with, hey, there's a problem. We need you to look into this. They did fully look into one of their own. They fired this man. They have also provided the public with a good amount of resources and information on this case. You can find what we covered here today as well as more information on their website, the Collier County Sheriff's Office website. This case really blew up in 2012, and that was when Al Sharpton and then Tyler Perry Tyler Perry got involved in this case. Tyler Perry has offered up a bunch of his own money for information in either one of these cases. It's, in fact, it's up to $200,000 reward for information in either of these cases. Well, and this is not a hugely popular case. This is a great case to spotlight. This is a great case to share and get the public behind and put a little more pressure on individuals and maybe we'll get some answers for their families. That's right. And again, if anyone has any information in either of these cases or information about Officer Steve Calkins, please call Crime Stoppers. Again, that number is one 800 
All right, we want to hear from you. Go to our website, truecrimegarage.com, and go to our blog and let us know what you think about this case. Colonel, do we have any recommended reading for this week? This week, we are happy to recommend a new book from an author that true crime readers will recognize for certain. That is M. William Phelps has a new true crime book out called We Thought We Knew You. A terrifying true story of secrets, betrayal, deception, and murder. And we thought we knew you is receiving high praise, not only from our little garage show captain, but from the great Catherine Ramslin, who is one of the best in the business as well. So you know this is a damn good book. Check out We Thought We Knew You by M. William Phelps. And you can find that great book as well as others at truecrimegarage.com on our recommended page. Join us back here next week. Same garage channel, same garage time. Until then, be good, be kind, and please don't let it.